only Mike Hardington. He will be walking you through the process of building PWAs and why to use Ionic and how to use Ionic and build your PWAs. And without further ado, here's Mike. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar, uh, Progressive Web Apps with Ionic and how to build them and why you should actually care about them. Uh, so yeah, I'm a developer advocate for Ionic. I'm also a Google developer expert in mobile technologies, Angular, JavaScript. Uh, so I know a few things about uh, JavaScript and the mobile landscape. So I'm hoping to share some information with you. And uh, if you have some questions, please use the uh, webinar interface to post those questions and we can get to them later on in the webinar. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly on Twitter, uh, M Hardington, or if you find me in any of the Ionic uh, official channels, uh, I'm M Hardington basically everywhere. So I want to start this off uh, with a bit of an experiment. Uh, I hope that this you know goes well and that you are all get the point of it, but let's, uh, let's cross our fingers and see if this goes well. OK, so uh, thank you for bearing with me with that. Uh, we just waited 14 seconds. Uh, it might not seem like a lot of time. It might seem like forever. Uh, but the, uh, the truth about it is that 14 seconds is, on average, what people tend to wait uh, for their pages to load uh, on the mobile web, on these lower end devices, um, all across the world, based on you know, a huge study across all these typical web apps. Um, this is not that great, but considering that we are sending now megabytes of JavaScript over, you know, a 3G, sometimes really bad 3G networks, where we get stuck in a situation where we're just waiting and showing spinners or showing nothing, uh, and our users have to wait for all this code to either be parsed or to load or just be transferred over the network. Uh, now, this leads to an overall slow load. Uh, load time experience where users after about four, uh, five to six seconds are just going to either abandon the site or just initially forget why they even came to visit. Um, there's a huge uh, use case and study on this called the cost of JavaScript in 2018 by uh, Adi Osmani. Uh, if you follow that link down below, he goes over all this information that the Chrome team has been able to uh, used in their research and their uh, studies from the browser to figure out what is the average experience of, uh, of a user of the web and what are some of the key problems that people, uh, that web apps are kind of face in their day-to-day -day, uh, experience. So this kind of brings us to the point where progressive web apps come in to really improve a user experience on the web. Uh, they provide an optimized experience that often is smaller uh, in code per feature and faster than the native counterparts. For example, the Twitter PWA, it has about 400 kilobytes worth of code and does about 90% of what the native Twitter app does. And it's often faster and has a lot uh, better use, uh, user experience, in my, in my opinion. So this kind of gets to the point, it's like, well, what? do we have to do to like get a progressive web app? So in this case, we have to hit a few criteria, and I think these are the most important ones. Uh, being fast, uh, no one wants to sit around waiting 14 seconds for an app to load. If we can get our apps as fast as possible, you know, five seconds, maybe even three seconds, uh, users will want to use our app, and we can consider ourselves getting on that progressive web app path. Uh, it's right in the name, so progressive web app should be progressive. Essentially, we want to make sure that all of the content that we are, uh, all of these web features and all of our all aspects of our app that are being loaded, that if we're on an older browser that does not have new features, uh, we should still be able to function, albeit in a in a degraded experience. Uh, but if you are on a brand new Chrome or you know uh, on a desktop environment, you should be able to access these new features uh, pretty seamlessly. A progressive web app should also be secure. Now, this is the part that I think uh, 
should be solved in the next year or so, considering that most browsers will now warn users when they load a site over HTTP. So if you are not loading, your, uh, if you do not have uh, HTTPS set up on your site, be prepared. Users will be presented with a huge warning screen, uh, letting them know that things aren't going well. But aside from you know the browser actually warning users about accessing uh, an unsecure website, they'll just straight up disable certain APIs in the browser. For example, geolocation. You don't want geolocation data being accessed if you are not a secure site. So browser vendors just disable geolocation altogether. They disable geolocation, camera, any of these newer APIs that access more than just you know, JavaScript's key core functionality. These are features that are so important that, uh, that they are secure that they're just disabled if you're in an insecure environment. Now, the last key point is that web app, progressive web app should be installable, meaning that if a user is frequently visiting your website, they should be able to install that to the home screen of their device and have a better and more uh, integrated experience with that web app uh, without having to go through an app store and download a whole separate app. So these are the key features of a Progressive Web App. How do we go about building one? And I've broken this down to what I'm calling Mike's three Progressive Web App tenants. Uh, we're calling it make it fast, make it cash, make it installable. I tried really, really hard to find a third word that rhymed with fast and cash, but I wasn't able to do so. So we're just going to go with installable. So if we can get these three things down for our app, uh, we're going to have you know, a progressive web app that users will love to visit and users will be happy to install on their home screen and have this great experience. So let's, catch, uh, let's tackle the first part and that is making our web app fast. Uh, to do this, we're gonna focus on two goals or mainly one higher goal and that is shipping less code. If we're sending down megabytes of code over the network and we're having to wait for all this to parse and for the browser to be able to load it, if we just ship less code, we'll have faster apps. But in an enterprise environment, this isn't always the easiest thing to do. Uh, you might have these large 40 to 50 page uh, apps where you have all these different routes with different components uh, and different bits of code that all need to be wired in together. So Cutting out features of a full functioning app isn't always the easiest thing to do. So what can we do alternatively that still allows us to ship less goal, uh, less code? And that's to look at lazy loading and to look at how we can choose different libraries to, uh, to reduce the code footprint uh, in our overall uh, bundle size. So lazy loading, uh, typically this is, you know, something that you should be doing um, right away to avoid any kind of architectural uh, pain points. Um, you want to be able to lazy load as much as possible with the goal of taking that main JS bundle and reducing that overall size uh, by a significant amount by lazy loading everything and re-architecting how your app brings in uh, assets and different bits of code. We can make our main JS bundle go from possibly a megabyte to two megabytes all the way down to say 400 to 300 kilobytes, uh, just so that way it has what it needs to render. Now, with this, we can also start to think about how do we want features to be loaded in our app? So if you're say on a user detail page or a user profile page, you can kind of guess that there are going to be uh, associated pages that you want to include in that single uh, chunk in this case. So as we start to architect our app, we can think about how our features and how our pages inside of our app are going to be loaded. Are these going to be loaded? Uh, should these be lo loaded together? Should these be part of a separate chunk? How do we want this to all work? Now, Angular, if we're working with Angular in this case, uh, this is built into the actual routing system uh, and it becomes really easy to set up. So let's go into this and actually dive into some code at first. So I have this app right here, uh, and I'm just going to run uh, Angular's build command and give it the prod flag. 
Uh, and if we dive into my seal, uh, into the app itself, we will disable the build progress. Uh, we can check a look at the app. Uh, yeah, app dot module. So we're inside of our app dot module, and let's start off from the top. Now, this is an app that I've been working on for a while, so. I have a lot of features. I have uh, a lot of different components, some different aspects of this app that are all being imported into my root module. So this essentially becomes my main JS. Now, and anytime you see this many imports or this many things being loaded into your main entry point of the app, this should be room. For, uh, this should be concerning. Uh, these are 21 different imports. Some of these, including some. Uh, some core features, but a lot of this is um, including forms module and the reactive forms modules, even though I know they're supposed to be used on separate different uh, pages. Uh, I'm bringing in some directives that might not be used in the entire app component. And this uh, service, which I'm only using in one component, not in my entire app. What's Why is this being loaded here? So this is our red flag number one. We have a lot of excess imports. Uh, another thing to notice is this declarations array. We have a lot of components being loaded in here. Uh, it's only seven lines, but I still think that this is a key uh, flag to look for when thinking about lazy loading and how to optimize this app. So in this case, we have the app component. That's to be expected. We have the shell page. And then we have two additional pages and then some other components. But this is only supposed to include the logic needed for this entire root component. So I really should only be having this one app component and maybe this shell page as well. So red flag number two, an excess amount of components in our declarations. Uh, red flag number three, in our router config, we have static imports to the components uh, when we are setting up routing. So in this case, whenever we load the index of our app, we should load the shell page component. But in this search URL, we're loading the search page. And in the detail URL, we're loading the track detail. We should not be declaring these components in line using the static import method. This is not optimized and can lead to slow uh, and including an excess amount of code in our main app. Uh, again, we still have all these additional things coming up in the imports. Providers is uh, rather large. And then entry components is also something that's existing. Uh, this should not be in the root app module, in my opinion. Uh, and to end this off, we have a 73 line uh, file where we're just setting up all the, including all the assets for our app. This is, again, this is not optimized and it's pretty. Uh, it leaves a lot of room for improvement. So our app has finished building. Let's run a, a server. And let's go back to, uh, in this case, I'm using Chrome. And I'm going to open up the dev tools. Uh, I'm going to do disable some caching. I'm going to also make sure that I have everything cleared out as far as uh, previously cached data. And to make sure, yep, everything looks like it's coming through correctly. Cool. So this is our app. It's the unoptimized version of our app. And let's load this. Now, if we come down here to the bottom side of our uh, dev tools, we see that we are getting uh, a load of 1.18 uh, seconds. And then DOM content loaded is coming in at 800 milliseconds. Now, you might think, oh, 800 milliseconds, 1.8 seconds. We're already loading our app really fast. Uh, ship it. Yeah, we're good. We can just call this call this done. But we're on local hosts. We're, we're, we're accessing files from the file system. We're not necessarily uh, emulating a typical experience. So up here in the dev tools, we have these uh, features for emulating network connections. So in this case, let's go to fast 3G. Uh, I have cache disabled to make it seem like I'm just loading my app uh, from a fresh 
uh, from a fresh uh, entry point. So we'll reload. What we're going to notice is this main JS file is going to be our main bottleneck. So this took about four and a half seconds to load, leading us to our final load time around 7.62. This is starting to be problematic because if we're waiting for this app, uh, if we're waiting for this to load, we're going to be stuck in a point where nothing can be done, no content, nothing can be painted uh, with this shown. So what if we go to slow 3G? And this is going to be the more painful one where we just watch this time just tick because we are downloading so much JavaScript uh, that even though I have this little image presented here, I can't do anything. I'm just waiting. We're now up to 16 seconds. Uh, and around, yeah, 16 point, 16 point uh, and three quarters of a second for the entire app to load. And our final load time comes down to 26.12 uh, seconds. This is not acceptable. Uh, no one's going to wait this long for our app to load. So let's optimize this. We're going to kill our library load server. I'm going to check out uh, add lazy loading. So I have the branch of this code already set up. And I'm going to run our build again. Uh, just let this do its own thing. And then I'll refresh this page. Now, we already have an improvement. And that is having a reduced amount of imports. So we've we've thought ahead, we've taken a look at all the imports in our code, and we figured out, OK, certain things here and there aren't necessarily needed right away. Let's get rid of them or move them out to separate modules. Our declarations has been reduced down to two components, which is much more acceptable. And then our routing configuration. We're still including this shell page in our main bundle because we want to make sure that this is automatically included and not uh, requiring an extra request, we want this to be bundled right away so we can get uh, a better perceived performance. But if we come down here to our additional routes, we're using the load children uh, property inside of the router config to lazy load this route. Uh, so this will go through and it will fetch everything and then instantiate its own module. Uh, we're going to be doing the same thing down here in the uh, detail route. Uh, again, we have the bootstrap. We completely got rid of entry components. And we reduced our providers down to only what we need for this initial component load. Now, let's take a look at this, uh, at this search page module. So we'll go to search.module. Now, this includes all of the things needed for this search page to be able to render. So we can think of this, if we were to pull this out of our app and just include it in its own standalone thing, this search page should be able to render. So we include the router module where we have our lazy loaded component. And in this case, where we can go back to the static analysis, uh, static import. We have the reactive form modules without including this uh, other forms module. And then all of the additional modules needed for our search page. So this is a much better uh, experience. If we were to go check out the track detail module, we'll see something uh, similar where we're including additional components uh, and still having that router module in our app. So we have this much more organized piece of code um, versus loading everything else into that app module. So let's go down. We have the build done. And we're going to run our server again, come back down here, and let's go to fast3g. So as this is loading, we're still seeing some delay time, but it's much uh, better than what it was in the non-lazy loaded example. And we can see down here, we're including all of these different uh, <clears throat> all of these different lazy loaded modules inside of our app. So we have the module for the track detail uh, search page and then the search page component. Then we have the module for the track detail because if we go check out our app module, 
we're using this preloading uh, option to preload additional modules. That way we have the, the placeholder code already in memory and we can just have that ready and have no delay inside of our app. So this is really nice. It provides a much better experience. So let's build the server and go back to the slides for now. So in an essence, all we did was go from the, having this router module where we have all of our components being statically imported to this lazy loaded approach where everything can be organized. So all of those additional components, all those additional imports, they were a side effect of how our code was loaded in the router. So now we have load children where we can lazy load different pieces of code. We have everything kind of isolated and, um, and architected well, and we can preload things as we need them. So that way we're not delaying uh, our user experience. So kind of uh, uh, in a nutshell, what, we are, what are we talking about? Lazy load as much as possible. Once we get into that lazy loading, uh, position, we can start to organize all of our apps or all of the chunks, different uh, assets in a, in, a, um, in, a, in a manner that can be self-contained. And then important, we are looking at our dev tools to measure what were we changing. Is this a good improvement? Is this a bad improvement? We can see this and have some data to back up those changes. So this is something that we should be doing from day one. And in fact, with the Ionic CLI, Modules and lazy loaded code are kind of provided out of the box. You run Ionic G page and you'll get a entirely lazy loaded route automatically configured and set up for you. So this is a way we're able to help out and get devs on the right path. So additional uh, ways to reduce the code. Pick the li li right libraries. Uh, it's, you know, might sound root mean, but not all libraries are created equal. There are some good libraries and there are some bad libraries. And most of the bad libraries, I would argue, are common JS format. And basically, we get to a point where we have all of these different libraries and all of this different code. And if we're only using one function from that library, uh, if the library shift is common JS, unfortunately, we have to include all of that code in our app bundle. We can't remove that code or do what's called tree shaking. Instead, if we were to include libraries that are only shipped as ES modules, we could remove all that excess code that's not being used and reduce the amount of code, uh, reduce the overall footprint uh, of our app code. So for example, uh, MomentJS, it's a very popular date formatting library, but if you automatically include this into your app, you're getting around 335 kilobytes of, of a code increase. Now, this is because of the way MomentJS is shipped. It's an entire CommonJS library. It includes everything, uh, whether or not you use it. So even if you just call the core format functionality, you're going to get all the additional pieces of MomentJS plus the, the locales that it supports. Not necessarily a good thing. On the other hand, if you look at a library called DateFNS, uh, and particularly their ESM import path, we can include the core format function uh, and only pay about 23 kilobytes for including that. This means that we don't need to include the additional functionality of the FNS because it's shipped as a ES module. Our build tools can come in and can uh, intelligently remove the code that's not being used and give us the smallest footprint that we can possibly have, which is great, which is what we want. Now, not every library is going to give you this drastic of a, of a difference. Moment.js is a very special use case. Most of the time, we're going to see something like looking at Lodash. Uh, Lodash is super popular, uh, but comes at a cost about 70 kilobytes. Now, not necessarily huge, but we can change the import in the package that we use to Lodash ES. It's a, exactly the same bit of code that Lodash is, uh, maintained by the same people, just republished as ES modules. So instead of importing everything from Lodash, we can import certain functions from Lodash ES. In this case, I went and imported the without function. And my code, uh, the final output ended up only going up by about five kilobytes. This is really uh, great. So instead of having to include everything and possibly not using it, uh, or including all the libraries as packages, we can just use the ES package format 
uh, include the things that we need. And in fact, this is how Ionic kind of works for our V4 uh, release. So anytime we are inside of, uh, of a component and we need to load additional resources, we can lazily load that code without having to include it in the final output. So for example, if you're on a home page and you have a header bar, a toolbar, a couple of buttons, you're only going to pay the cost for that header, toolbar, the buttons, all of the code that's in that page. Uh, Ionic module will intelligently load that code as it's needed and not include the unused components in that, in that chunk. So we can make sure that all the code that you're uh, including in your app is as small as possible. So some takeaway and some resources that you could look at. Um, Angular CLI in Angular apps has a great feature called budgets, which allow you to set breakpoints for if your vendor uh, bundle ends up uh, going over a certain amount or if your chunks end up going over a certain amount, you can set warnings or errors so that way the build will actually fail. And you can figure out how you uh, what parts of your app are the problematic areas. Another tool is Source Map Explorer, uh, which is what I use to analyze the code increase of my um, of the apps with Moment.js and Lodash. Uh, it, you feed it a co uh, you feed it some JavaScript and then a source map file, and it will uh, display the actual breakdown of this bit. Uh, this many kilobytes of of uh, code are coming from this library, and this bit is coming from here. It'll show you where everything is uh, coming from. All right, so at this point, we're, we've done enough that we can make our app smaller. What can we do next? Well, from here, we're going to work on making our app cache. Uh, and essentially, we're going to be using uh, a technology called Service Worker. Uh, Service Worker has probably been talked about uh, a lot in recent months, probably in this past year. It's been brought up to the main stage. But for those who don't know what it is, it's essentially a proxy uh, that sits in between your app and intercepts all incoming and outgoing requests. So if your app's making a request to an API from the service worker, you can look at that request, modify it, or just straight out cancel it. If data is coming back from a request from the server, the service worker will get that data first and can, again, modify it, return something else, or just cancel the request and throw an error. So we have a lot of power going on here. Uh, and typically, Service Worker is used for caching, but it can do a lot of other things as well. Uh, to get Service Worker into our app, we're going to use this uh, feature detection where if Service Worker is available, we'll register our Service Worker file and then we can log that out and catch any errors and handle the promise from our register. Now, a pretty simple example is this uh, pre-cache kind of pattern where uh, once a service worker has been registered, we get this activate event. And as soon as we get that event, we can go through and we can start opening up a cache where we can send all of the app's resources uh, before the app has finished loading. So in this case, we're just uh, caching main.js, main.css. Uh, we have all this ready and available uh, before the app has even finished loading. So that way, on subsequent visits, it's almost instant. And if you want some great examples of different uh, service worker ideas and recipes, uh, there's a site down below that you can go visit, which includes uh, setting up different caching patterns, different um, different ways for handling uh, requests coming back from the network, or how to return cache data or fresh data. Uh, and from that, you can kind of might be able to guess that Service Worker is complex. It has a lot of moving parts. Uh, and if you really want to write your own caching mechanism, uh, you can do that, but you might not want to. I mean, for example, this is Twitter's uh, part of Twitter's P uh, Service Worker. Obviously, not human written code. It's probably all generated. But yeah, this is a thing. This is out there in a production app right now. And it gets to the point that service workers are complicated, uh, really complicated in some parts. And they require a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, 
a lot of things to consider. Uh, and to do this effectively, we're going to use a library. Uh, there's a couple of them out there, but we're going to look at ones that's specific to Angular. So let's go in and make our app cache. So in our app, actually, let's, let's start this server again. So in our app, we're noticing that even if we disable the cache, um, or if we have that cache coming in, we're going to have all of our code kind of just coming from the network, regardless of whether or not we, uh, regardless of not whether or not we have it or we need it necessarily. So if we disable the cache over here, uh, we're essentially just going to fetch it from memory, which you know from disk cache is not really what we want. We want to be able to cache this so that way if we go offline, we don't get a sad Chrome dinosaur. So let's go to our code again uh, and let's check out add uh, add service worker, this service worker branch. And in here, we're going to just open up this ng sw config file. Now, in our code, we have this ngswconfig config file. It sits at the root of our project, and we can start to build up our service worker configs using just JSON, which is a far easier and more approachable uh, way of working with service workers. So in this case, we have this install mode. We have this whole object for different assets. This We're essentially recreating this prefetch or pre-cache pattern that we had in our slides where we're giving it all of our additional CSS and JavaScript and just saying, cache it as the app is loading. Again, uh, we also have this second configuration for uh, assets that are being used in our app. Ng build prod, sorry, I forgot to build. Uh, but in this pattern, we have all the code, uh, all the setup that we need for anything coming from the app's resources. So we have this assets folder, uh, anytime we're requesting data from there, we should just cache it right away. So this is uh, pretty easy to set up. We just give it a glob pattern, which I find to be really nice. Uh, and then we can say install it lazily, lazily meaning don't go up and um, try to fetch it right away. Just as it's being requested, just cache it from there. Now, we also have this data groups uh, array where we can cache external API requests. So in this case, I created an entry called the iTunes API. And because my app only talks to one endpoint, uh, I'm just going to cache any request. Any request going out to the iTunes API, I'm just going to cache it. Now, what's really nice in here is this caching config, which means we can figure out how do we want the app to behave when we go through and make a request. So in this case, we're going through the strategy called performance, meaning that if the network request comes back uh, within five seconds, use the network request. If it takes longer than five seconds, just give me the cache data. So we can figure, we can, instead of having to do a whole bunch of conditionals, uh, we can just say performance, and it automatically handles that for us. Uh, we can set maximum age, so five days. Uh, if the app, if the cache data is older than five days, it'll automatically be purged and replaced with new data. Maybe you want this to be 10 minutes or 10 seconds even. Uh, you can have all this kind of handled for uh, automatically by just passing in this data. Now, let's go down to our server, get this going again, and go back online. And we have our app uh, loading. And if we go over to this Applications tab, we have this Service Worker feature over here where we can see that we have our Service Worker enabled. Now, if we go to the network tab again, we can reload. And instead of seeing from memory cache or from disk cache, we should be seeing the service worker. So all this content has already been cached. And if we go offline and reload, we're still going to be able to access our app. We're still going to have all the resources kind of loaded automatically and have that available uh, for our user to interact. So that way, they're not just getting a uh, an old version of our app or an offline dinosaur, they have something that they can interact with. Now, how do we get this and access this inside of our app? Uh, because we're in an Angular app, we can actually just go to our app module. And we have this new import from the Angular service worker package. 
and we are importing the service worker module, and then we're also importing the environment. So we have this service worker module where we're registering this ngsw worker file. Uh, this is predetermined by the Angular CLI, so this is uh, this is automatically done for us. We don't need to think about it, so it'll automatically be generated. And then we're only going to enable it if we're deploying to a production environment. We don't want to cache content as we're inside of our development mode, because we might just have cases where content is not updating as we're editing our app. So service worker is included in our app module. And then inside of our uh, angular.json file, we have this feature called service worker where we can just set that to true. We can also do something where we can say, oh, ng build dash dash prod dash dash service, uh, service worker uh, equals true. So we can configure this uh, programmatically or just set it right into the Angular service worker, uh, angular.json file. So this is automatically handled for us and pretty much done by the uh, Angular service worker library. And with just adding that, we have all this caching enabled, uh, which is really nice. So kind of a recap of this. Uh, we have this npm install command where we just install the service worker uh, uh, library. We have our uh, configuration for the ng uh, sw config file. And then from there, we just enable it inside of our app module. Again, only enabling it during pro production. With uh, the Angular Service Worker package installed, we also have access to a few additional things. One of these being the SW update functionality. Now, if we were in a situation where we are caching our data, how do we how do we check to see if there's new data coming back from the server? Or how do we notify our users if there's a new version of the app? With the SW update class, we can include that inside of our app and we can provide some kind of UI uh, using say Ionic Toast or an Ionic Alert, where we can say, hey, We've checked the cache uh, and we checked the network. There's a new version of this app. Let's reload. And we can apply those updates using uh, the SW update package, our library. There's also, if you want to get into push notifications, the SW push class, where we can start to work with push notifications like Firebase Cloud Messaging or any other third party services. So, this is stuff that we can start to work with that touch on the newer aspects of Service Worker that. Uh, go beyond just caching. Uh, definitely something to look into, and I encourage you guys to check it out uh, in your own time. So the last part that we kind of want to go over is to make our app installable. Now, you might be thinking, why would we even want our app to be installable? It's part of the web, right? We should just be able to access it from the browser. We, we should be able to, but there's something special about being installed or something being uh, special about being on the user's home screen. It's a really place, it's a uh, really uh, special place to be and shows that the user cares about that app. You know, it provides a great experience, uh, especially when you consider how native handles it. You know, apps are automatically installed and available. They're right at the home screen or in the app draw. And they can be loaded and have this instant access, even if they're not uh, online. And kind of from a vanity uh, perspective, having an app on, uh, app icon on your home screen just makes you feel really good. So how do we get this and how do we handle this inside of our app? Uh, we're going to look at the manifest. Uh, app manifest is, again, another JSON file that we can use inside of our app. Uh, we declare this inside of the uh, inside of our index.html, we can say, here's our app name, here's the different icons, here's the different uh, ways we want to be displayed when we're installed. We can handle all this configuration automatically. Uh, and I have this nice little video over here that uh, should illustrate this a little bit better. So we have our app loading, and we are just loading up the app. And before the URL has even fully parsed out our index.html, 
we have the status bar color being tinted. We have the URL bar being changed. So the browser has already picked up that there's a manifest and has read it. So we have this better experience uh, automatically. So after the app is fully loaded, our header bar kind of feels like it's almost bleeding into the URL bar, feeling like what's, it's getting beyond just a web app or a website. So if we close the app and actually go to the home screen, we have our app icon and the app name already being displayed. We have this kind of already done. Uh, it's already reading it and figuring it out. Hey, display this icon. When we click on the icon itself, we have the icon again being composited into a background color and the app name. So that way we can have this launch image uh, pre-built for us by the browser. When we go from here, we can actually see that when the app fully loads, we have the status bar, uh, we have the header bar of our app, but the URL bar is actually gone and the app feels more like a native app. So how do we actually do this? Or what's the config used for uh, Star Trek uh, in production? So we'll go back to the app and we're going to check out master because this is where I have everything uh, set up. So we'll look for the manifest file. Uh, this can be called whatever you want. I called it manifest.webmanifest for some linting reasons. Uh, but you could just call it manifest.json and have that ready for you. So here's our name and our short name. Uh, basically, we have the name, which could be many characters long. And then we have the short name in case uh, the phone wants to has limited space. So in this case, on Android, we're only going to use short name. And full name can be used for some SEO and uh, searching capabilities. We have theme color and background color, which is setting the URL bar and then setting the background color of our uh, launch image that gets generated for us. Display mode, which basically hides all that browser UI, so we don't need that. Orientation is pretty self-explanatory. We can say, oh, give me portrait, give me landscape, default to portrait, but I'll let them use uh, switch around. So we have some options over here. Start URL basically means load at index. We could say load at a couple different part uh, paths later. Uh, in case we are want the user to automatically be logged in. But this is pretty nice uh, for my app because I don't have any login. I just want to uh, bring them to the start page. Scope is uh, just a special way to say, hey, what access, uh, how much access does the service worker have? Or does this uh, manifest have? Uh, and in this case, we have the one part that I don't think any uh, platform has managed to solve yet. And that's this icons. We have a lot of icons over here to deal with the different display resolutions and different screen sizes out there. Uh, there are some common ones that we can include, like the 512, 192, 152, 128, and also 96, 72, and 48. So we have a few different common, a uh, few common ones that we can get 90% of there. Uh, but there's a whole lot of websites out there that will show you what icons you actually need. Um, you might not need all of these, but you might also want all of these for additional uh, additional devices. Uh, once we have this actually include uh, generated, we can go to our source index.html, and then we use this link rel manifest tag to link back to the actual uh, manifest file. So this is a great way. This is how we're able to tell the app hey, from here, just load this before the uh, rest of the app has actually been uh, loaded. So this is pretty simple. We have uh, the rest of our app just loading, but we already have that manifest generated and loaded before the app is even done. So let's kind of wrap up a few things. Uh, I said at the beginning, we want to make our app fast. We wanted to make it cache, and we want to make it installable. If we got those three things done, we would have a very fast, highly rated, progressive web app. How do we actually deal with this? Uh, so part of my big thing is I like to measure, and I like to have some kind of data to back up my, uh, uh, one of my talking points. We have two resources that we can use. 
the web page performance test, which is a third party uh, service that will uh, check a live URL and uh, analyze, you know, it's fast 3G, it's on a lower end device, how does it perform? And in this case, we get A's across the board. So I'm doing really well in there. And then Chrome actually offers uh, Lighthouse, which is a in browser resource to detect and analyze app performance. It's uh, progressive web app capabilities, SEO and accessibility. And we can see here performance is 91. So this is a really performing app. We have 100% of a web progressive web app capabilities. We have manifest service worker We're being served over HTTPS. Uh, and we can see the breakdown of how our app actually performs. I uh, have a little work over here in first meaningful paint, but we have pretty good uh, results coming back from everything else. So we have a fast progressive web app. Yay, that's great. Kind of go into some bonus rounds. Uh, these are additional things that I, I, I researched while making this presentation, but I didn't have enough time to talk about. Uh, the manual part of creating a service worker and a manifest file, that has already been uh, abstracted away by the Angular CLI, and you can run ng add at Angular PWA to generate a placeholder service worker file, uh, a placeholder manifest, and also include some icons. So if you want to pass those off to your designer, they can generate their own icons using those as a base size. Uh, and send them back to you. But also, you have all of this kind of done and uh, automated. Server-side rendering and essentially uh, pre-rendering with Angular Universal is a nice way to look at how to increase your perceived performance. So instead of having to render everything client-side, you can just do some pre-rendering and include that first route in as static uh, HTML in your app. So your pre uh, perceived performance can be improved a lot. Uh, NG Toolkit it is a collection of schematics around Angular Universal, kind of an add-on uh, to make the experience a lot better. Uh, I, I, I really like this project. It's done by one person. I really think everyone should check it out if you're doing Angular work. Uh, and then another third-party library called PWA Compat from the Chrome team. This kind of works around all of the PWA manifest uh, quirks that exist inside of Safari in iOS. So it'll automatically create the app icon, automatically create the launch images for you based on additional resources uh, provided by the manifest file. Uh, I included this in Star Trek. And on iOS, I already have an icon. I already have a launch image without having to go through a whole bunch of work uh, to figure out iOS's weird ways of handling things. So these are some additional things that you should look at. Uh, PWA Compat, I would think, is the most important one. Uh, but definitely uh, check this stuff out. And to kind of wrap it up, uh, we have uh, uh, something to consider. 14 seconds is a very long time. Don't let your web app go load in 14 seconds. Always shoot to, perform, uh, to improve the performance and your users will be happy and you'll have a happy app. So before we get to the Q&A, I want to introduce uh, Brody Kidd, who's an enterprise account manager, uh, and want to just talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that we're doing at Ionic and how we can help your actual uh, enterprise environment. Brody. Hey, thanks, Mike. Um, awesome presentation. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Hopefully, it was helpful. Um, really appreciate you guys taking the time to learn more about PWAs. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit more if you didn't. Um, you know, if you wanted to take an additional uh, step back and either, you know, if it was too advanced for you and you wanted to just have a general conversation, we'd love to do that. Um, you know, talk about strategy and other things. But if you wanted to dive a little bit more into the technical weeds, we'd also be, uh, you know, super happy to jump on a call and talk through some of those technical things with you guys. So. Uh, a little intro on me, though. Um, you know, I've been here at Ionic for five years, and the reason that I'm super excited about, you know, PWAs in general is just the fact that we're finally at this point, and Mike went over it, but we're finally at this point where we're at the world, um, you know, where web tech, modern browsers, the hardware in our hands, um, things like service workers, we can finally take full advantage of the web um, instead of just being kind of that second-class citizen. So. 
Again, if you guys want to have a deeper conversation about PWAs or, you know, you're at an enterprise team and you're thinking about um, PWAs in terms of uh, a strategy moving forward with mobile, I uh, would love to chat with you guys. Uh, feel free to email me. My email's right there. You can, you know, find me on LinkedIn. You can also just DM me on Twitter. Um, but yeah, thanks again. And, and hopefully this was helpful. I'm going to pass it right back to you, Mike. All right. Thank you, Brody. So... <clears throat> The source code for everything that we kind of went over is up on GitHub. If you go to github.com and Hardington Star Trek, you can see examples and different branches of all this code. Um, from here, let's dive into some of the Q&A. And for this, I'm going to open up the webinar software and let's kind of just go from here. So Mike, one question we have is, PWA push notifications available in iOS? Uh, so right now, no. iOS has uh, limited support for certain service worker features like push notifications. And iOS specifically has their own API for this. Um, but that really shouldn't matter too much. Uh, if we are smart and we are feature detecting certain uh, capabilities, we should be able to use that in browsers that have push notifications and gracefully fall back to uh, other implementations uh, for non-standard uh, compliant browsers. Awesome. Um, the audience is also curious, if the what is the uh, terminal UI extension you were using? <laughs> uh, that is uh, uh, iTerm. Uh, and if you go to GitHub mhardington and search my dot files, that's all up there. It's a common question. Um, the audience is also curious, were you using Ionic 4? Yes, so this was an app uh, built entirely using Ionic 4 and Angular 6, uh, and I'm in the progress of upgrading this to Angular 7, and also uh, uh, new releases of Ionic as they uh, become available. Um, and then the audience was curious, how does this sit with something like Ionic 4 and Vue.js? Is it the same principle? So yeah, a lot of what we talked about might have been specific to Angular, uh, but a lot of the concepts and ideas still uh, transcend your different frameworks. So lazy loading. Vue also has a concept of how to lazy load routes uh, that you can take advantage of in your Vue applications. Uh, same thing with React, same thing with every framework, essentially. So uh, in the router config for a view file, instead of it being a string reference, we just create a dynamic import to the component, and we have that available for us. How would you solve the discoverability of your PWA app? In terms of, so in terms of SEO, uh, the PWA is fairly uh, discoverable. Uh, the browser vendors and crawlers will automatically pick up this manifest. Uh, specifically, we'll highlight uh, uh, Microsoft and Edge's crawler. Uh, it'll automatically parse out that PWA's, uh, our PWA's manifest file and print out the result in Bing. Uh, but it'll also go in and include it as a Windows app in the Window App Store. So these become essentially uh, discoverable discoverable through search engines and traditional app store uh, interfaces. And also, uh, what are the limitations of PWAs? Right now, where the main limitations is essentially uh, what JavaScript is capable of. Uh, for instance, we're just getting access to things like web Bluetooth, uh, web USB in some cases, uh, and other features that JavaScript just is working on. So I would say the limitations is the standard process, figuring out how to get uh, certain capabilities in the app, uh, in the language and in the browser. Uh, it's it's kind of slow. It's a long, um, it's a arduous process. So we just have to be patient and kind of wait for features to be shipping. Um, other than that, basically, if you want to do anything in a native app, you can do them in a service, uh, a PWA as well. And then in regards to uh, you know, our principles of being hybrid and cross-platform, uh, can PWAs and mobile apps be built on the same code base with Ionic 3 and 4 when it comes out? Uh, yeah, actually, I have this app existing as a native Android app and also as a native iOS app. 
but also as the progressive web app portion, it, depending on certain uh, the certain requirements, whether or not you want to have access to app store features like in-app purchases, um, you might want to have access to that on the native platforms, but you might just want to give the users a quick and easy experience with progressive web apps. So you can do both uh, and just feature detect certain capabilities, whether or not you're on progressive web app or on the uh, native side. And then is Ionic, we as Ionic, advocating that more SB PWAs instead of hybrid apps? I think it really depends on your use case and what you are trying to do and achieve. Uh, definitely take a look at some of the features that you're trying to use. If you don't need a lot of native like API access, um, progressive web apps are definitely an option and definitely a way to go forward. But if you need like specific access to the file system, to native capabilities like Bluetooth. Um, these are things that are still being worked on and might require a native app. So there's definitely cases where both can be argued, but we have the options to do both with Cordova, Capacitor, uh, and all these native plugins. And then can you identify if a PWA is served over a meter connection or Wi-Fi? There are some there are some capabilities with the network API. Um, I'm not too particular, uh, not too uh, knowledgeable about it. But if you were to check out um, MDN, Mozilla uh, Dev Network, uh, they have an extensive documentation on all these new JavaScript APIs. Look up the network API. Uh, that should be able to uh, go in and show you the network types uh, that's being returned. And then. Do we have uh, use cases or examples where we think PWA should be built um, in regards to using a PWA over like a traditional hybrid app? Um, where are PWAs more beneficial? Um, I would I would say probably a lot of e-commerce. Um, I mean, not necessarily. You don't necessarily need to submit something to the store if you just want users to buy something. Uh, quickest way to get them to buy something is just provide a fast website and a fast web experience. Uh, there's a lot of case studies by the Chrome team, essentially around Alibaba uh, or AliExpress, that go into how they were able to use the PWA to improve their uh, user experience and user retention and increase sales uh, by a significant amount. So I would say e-commerce is probably one of the biggest situ uh, biggest way places to look at if you want to. Uh, build PWAs and when it, oh, versus a native app. And then uh, one last uh, question: Is there any downside to lazy loading? So one theoretical downside would be the network latency when you go to include uh, request an additional asset. Uh, for instance, if you were to be on 4G and you load the app and then somehow move to uh, 2G or low, bad 3G, there's going to be some kind of delay while that asset is being um, being requested and returned from the server. Uh, I would say that a good way to work around this is to look into preloading. Uh, Angular's router has an option for that, and I'm sure Vue does as well, where you can start to preload assets as the app is loaded uh, and there's some idle time. Uh, so, But I would say network, uh, network latency would be the biggest downside. Cool. Well, I think this is a good place to stop and wrap. Um, once again, guys, thanks for taking the time to join us. We really enjoy uh, putting these programs on for you guys. We will be sending a recording to everyone with the links from the presentation that uh, Mike shared with you today. And if you guys have any questions or would like to talk to someone from our uh, App strategy team to help you know your business needs. You can definitely email Brody at Ionic.io, and he can you know help identify best solutions for your business and your business's needs. Otherwise, we will have some more webinars coming up in the near future, and look forward to seeing you there. Bye, everyone. Take care.